All righty. <laughs> so let's finish up these notes from yesterday. All right, and we'll go from there. And again, I think we're just going to set these up and not so much worry about, you know, integrating and stuff like that. Um, well, I guess this one we have to kind of, well, anyway, right. we'll just set them up as much as we can, okay, and not worry about too much of the work, or as little of the work as we can do. Okay, so if you remember from yesterday, right, we were talking about kind of like this, this unit is called the applications of integration. So we kind of, I mean, we like, you know, we, we just talked about differential equations, with this, which is kind of like mixing the derivatives together with integrals and things and stuff like that and using those concepts simultaneously in some sense. But um, this next unit we're in, now seven, chapter seven, is called like applications of the integral. And so, for example, right here we can find the area of these like strange regions, right, that are this like not, you know, a typical kind of shapes that we're used to seeing, you know, but um, using integration, you know, calculus, we can like, you know, take the area and then subtract another area and then result with this kind of like leftover odd shape, okay, which is a little bit different, you know. In the past, we had, you know, really... Anytime you want to find the area of a shape, you kind of try to break it down into like rectangles or like pieces of other familiar shapes and stuff like that. And I guess in a sense, when you integrate something, we are kind of breaking it down to an infinite number of rectangles right, when we find that area. So anyway, you know, it's pretty much straightforward as far as like what you do, right? We're just taking the area of the top curve, subtracting the area under the, of the bottom curve, and then that gives us the area between the two regions there, okay? Um, sometimes we do that with respect to y, right? When the curves are written, in terms of y, all right, it's helpful to try and do that um, integration in terms of y as well. Of course, then you want to also change your limits of integration to be y limits of integration, not x limits of integration. Okay, and of course, half the battle is making sure that you're integrating the right piece. So, for example, here in this region, right, it was, it was just this region that we're trying to um, find the area of that. Okay, and so we had to be careful here because the top curve and the bottom curve changed as we kind of moved left to right here. Here, the top curve was you know, uh, square root of x, bottom curve was the x-axis, and so we had to set up a separate integral uh, for that right here, okay? And then it changes at 2. So now the top curve is still the square root of x, but then I have to subtract now this bottom curve of the x minus 2, okay? And that yields that part of the integral there. So sometimes you've got to break it up, okay, um, if necessary. All right. That being said, now we're moving on to your number 7, all right, which is bit of a, you know, turn from the earlier ones we did here. So it says the region R bounded by the curve G of X equals the cosine of X, the X axis and the vertical lines X equals zero and X equals C changes as C increases. Okay. If C increases at a rate of pi units per second, how fast is the area of region R increasing when C is pi over 6. Okay, so the graph of cosine, okay, the graph of cosine here starts at 1 and then at um, pi over 2 at 0, and then we'll kind of like uh, we can keep going here too, I guess. Okay, so on and so forth. There's pi. Okay, and so on and so forth. Um, okay. <clears throat> so for our region here, it's kind of a little bit tricky to like really nail down what that region is going to look like because while we do have a, you know, it's x equals 0, okay, is one of our limits of integration here. So like, or one of, well not limits, but like our boundaries. Okay, so there's x equals 0. Uh, but then also x, the x-axis is as well, so right here. But then we also have x equals c, is our other boundary here. And that C, we don't know where it is exactly, right? Okay, it's like somewhere, we'll say maybe somewhere in here, okay, just, just because, but it really could be anywhere, I guess, along here. Um, so we have some like C value right there. And then so it'd be like finding the area of this region. Okay. Because again, we want to be the x axis is a boundary, the vertical line x equals 0, the vertical line x equals C, and then the graph of cosine of x. Okay. So, our integral here would be, um, for the area, would be the integral from what to what? Zero to C. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, zero to C. Okay, actually, maybe I should, instead of saying A, maybe I'll call this R since we're talking about the region. 
R there, so I'll change that to R. Okay. So R equals the integral from 0 to C. What's our top curve for this region? Cosine x. What's the bottom curve? Yeah, it's just 0. So it's cosine x minus 0, if you like. Okay, but also just cosine x, too, is fine. All right, so there's our setup. There's our setup. So, but we're asked, how fast is the area of region R increasing? So we're not asking to find the area of region R. We're asked to find the rate of change of region, uh, region R, which means we need to do what? Take the derivative. With respect to what? So we have x's, we have y's, but we're increasing at a rate of t units per second here. So we're given our rate of change of c in units per second. And we want to know how fast is the area of region R increasing. And so at this, we want to actually take the derivative with respect to t here. Respect to t, OK? So take the derivative with respect to t. And so that's going to leave us here with dr dt, okay, the rate of change of t with respect to time. How fast is the area of the region R increasing? Okay. Okay, so dr dt equals, now, when we take the derivative of an integral, that is an application of the second fundamental theorem of calculus, right? And so the derivative of the integral of cosine is going to be just cosine. Okay, but then that's going, we're going to evaluate, well, I guess I should, sorry, I guess I should go ahead and plug in the c here. So it'll be cosine of c times the derivative of what's inside, the derivative of c with respect to t is dc dt. Okay. <clears throat> and then minus cosine of 0 plugged in there. Whoops, I'm putting a theta there. I'm making it it's cosine of 0. I did it again. <laughs> cosine of 0. There we go. Okay, I kept writing theta there. Mm, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, I guess. All right, cosine of 0. So anyway. Um, so there's our setup, right? There's our second fundamental number calculus. dr dt, that's what we're trying to find, right? How fast is the area of region R increasing? So that's what we're trying to solve for, OK? When c is pi over 6, aha, uh -huh, so we're going to plug pi over 6 in for c. OK, what is dc dt? What is the rate of change of c? Pi. c increases at a rate of pi units per second. So it's times pi. And then cosine of 0 is 1, so minus you know, 1 there. Oops, but it's times 0. The derivative of 0 times 0, so it's actually 1 times 0 there. <coughs> okay, I forgot to multiply by the derivative of 0, which is 0 as well, on the outside by that chain rule. So that lower limit's going to disappear. The lower limit's going to disappear. Okay. So cosine of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2 times pi. And so we get pi root 3 over 2. And since this is a rate of change of our region with respect to time, we'll say like units squared per second. OK? So pi root 3 over 2 units squared per second would be our answer. Questions on any of that? And that's just an application of the second fundamental thermic calculus there. And kind of like a, a related rate almost, right? Kind of like a related rate, right? Because it's not so much the, the value of the area that we're interested in. We're interested in the value of the rate of change of the area. So we, we, we relate the rates there and then solve. OK, all good? All right. So then uh, number eight, OK, this is from a old free response question. All right, this is? Calculator active, but again, I think what we're going to do here is just set this up, and then we'll, um, well, yeah, we'll just set them up. Okay, we will still need our calculators, though, even for the setup. All right, so have those handy. <coughs> All right, let f and g be the functions given by f of x equals 1 fourth plus sine pi x, and g of x equals 4 to the negative x. Let r be the shaded region in the first quadrant enclosed by the y-axis and the graphs of f, which is here and g, which is here, OK? Uh, let s be the shaded region in the first quadrant enclosed by the graphs of f and g as well shown in the figure. So our first objective here is to find the area of r. So the area of r okay, here is going to be the integral 
from, what's our lower limit of integration? Zero. Oh, it's going to be zero, right? What's our upper limit of integration? We don't know. Okay, how can we figure out this upper limit of integration here? I'll call this like, I don't know. I mean, I'll call it like C or something like that. Yes, so we're going to use our calculator. Okay, actually, we're going to use our calculator to do this too. Okay, so we're going to set these two things equal and find where they are, um, for what x value they're equivalent to each other, or at least the first x value. My recommendation is to, of course, you know, graph these. Okay, so kind of like graph this. <clears throat> Make sure your calculator is set to radians for this because we are dealing with trigonometry. <coughs> Make sure I'm set to radians too. Let's see if I can make this even better looking here. Okay. So there's a pretty, pretty good, you know, I'm, I'm using the window um, 0 to 2, 0 to 2. Okay. So there's a pretty good representation of, of what we see there on the graph in our paper notes there. So at this point, right, what do we want to use then? Now we've got the two curves graph, but what, what command do we want to use here to figure out the point that we're trying to find? Calc intersect. So second trace, which is the calc menu, go down to intersect. Okay, now, you got to be a little bit careful here, right? Our curves intersect at least twice, all right? So for this first aspect where it's asking for the first curve, you just got to make sure your little cursor there is on the first curve. That's fine. And then when it's asking for the second curve, again, just make sure your cursor is on the second curve. That's fine. But then for the guess, for the guess part, this is not just some like random, you know, thing we just hit enter and don't think about. Okay, the actual, what the idea is, you're supposed to move the cursor in towards the zero, sorry, the point of intersection that you want. So we move our cursor in towards the point of intersection we want, we hit enter, and then that will guarantee that it finds the correct point of intersection for us, especially since we see more than one on our graph there. Okay, and so the x value there is about 0 0.1782105. I would recommend against, I would recommend against rounding this, okay? Try and make this as precise as you can, all right? Remember, if you write more decimal places than what the AP people want, right? If you write more than three decimal places, they're just going to cut off after the third one. So it, you know, would behoove you to use as many as you can, especially in the case like this where we want to really get the most accurate calculation. So I recommend, you know, using this. Um, so, and if you want to, if you're like, oh, I'm going to be using this number a couple times, you can somewhere in your paper say, okay, let's just let C equal, you know, 0 0.1782185, and then I can say the area of R is the integral from, or you know, let C equal that, and so then we'll just say uh, area of R is the integral from 0 to C. Okay, and so in that scenario now, we don't have to, like, rewrite that whole decimal every time we want to, like, do some calculations here. Okay, <clears throat> so we've got our limits of integration. Now we have to do what our integrand is, the thing we're integrating. So what should we, what should we write here? Very good. It is g of x minus f of x, okay? Because remember that this <laughs> curve right here is g. And so in this scenario, g is on top right here. f is on the bottom for that section. G is on top, F is on the bottom. And so you don't need to write, you don't need to write the actual functions, you know, themselves here. You can just write G of X minus F of X in your integrand like that because it's already established what they are. Okay, so you don't need to like <laughs> rewrite those exact functions. Okay. When we go to do this on our calculators here, okay, you can go to your home screen, all right, and we'll hit math nine. And I lost my nice calculator so I have to use this but anyway so um, we can use our vars and y vars we can use like y1 and y2 since they're already typed in there right and so it's going to be the y2 minus y1 so I'll go back to here vars y vars function y2 minus vars y vars function y1 
with respect to x from 0 to, and now I've got to type this number in, 0.1782185. Okay, I know I said we were just going to set these up, but I think it's helpful to get the practice in also typing these in our calculator. So about 0 0.064, 65, I guess, if you round. Okay. Of course, if you want to, and maybe this is, you know, not a bad idea, you can go ahead and just write down as many of these decimals as you want. Okay, again... To maintain that, the APP will stop reading after three decimal places. So as long as you've got it matched up there, you should be good. Okay, something to think about. <clears throat> okay. So why don't you guys go ahead, take like a minute, set up the area for S. Okay, so go ahead, take like a minute there and find the area for S. Set up, set up the area for S. And if you also have time, go ahead and find the area as well. Okay, but go ahead, I'll let you guys do that. Now that we've done R, why don't you guys go ahead and set up the integral for the area of S. Okay. <coughs> so there's your integral to the area of S. Okay. I reused the um, the C value there of 0 0.1782 on either pi. That's our lower limit integration. The upper limit integration, the two intersect at 1. X value 1. Okay. And so then... Um, also, make sure you change the upper curve and the lower curve here. In this case, it is F that's the top curve, and G is the bottom curve. Okay? And so then you would have that as your answer. Yes, Emily. Um, so I like, understand all of that, but like, if the upper boundary was like 1, there's like a decimal again, could you just like make that another letter? Exactly. You say, like, let D equal, and then that crazy decimal, and then just do integral C to D if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. You, on your oh, on you got Okay. Stow. Exactly. The stow button. All right. So that is the what we were supposed to finish up yesterday. So now we'll get into what we're going to do today. Today we're going to be focusing on solids of revolution. All right. So um, we're going to find the volume of solids of revolution using something called the disk method. All right. Um, all right, so area is only one of many applications of the definite integral. Another important application is its use of finding the volume of three-dimensional solids. Um, we begin with solids of revolution. There's going to kind of be two different styles of solids that we're going to be finding. One where it's a solid formed by taking a two-dimensional region and rotating it about an axis 
to create a three-dimensional solid. And then the other kind of solid we'll make, um, I'll, bas I'll, I'll worry about explaining that when we get to that one. Okay? Um, so anyway, um, such solids are commonly used in engineering and manufacturing, like axles, funnels, bottles, etc. Uh, if a region in a plane is revolved about a line, the resulting solid is a solid of revolution. And the line is called the axis of revolution. The axis about which you rotate is the axis of revolution, right? The simplest such solid is formed by revolving a rectangle about an axis that is adjacent to one side of the rectangle, creating a cylinder. Okay, exactly right. Yes, this is something maybe you guys covered in geometry way back when. Okay. <clears throat> this is really the disc or the DIS, DISC. I don't know when you use one and when you use the other. <coughs> I guess something I should look up. But anyway, um, this is the, the disc that we're using in the disc method to find the volume of these solids. We're actually going to be using an uh, infinite number of infinitesimally short um, cylinders. Okay? So. Um, let's take a look at exactly what's going on here. So when you take that rectangular region, and this is where it gets a little crazy, but we'll see how we can do here. When you take like this rectangular region, and you place the rectangular region so that it's one of its sides is adjacent to this axis here. We're just going to use the x-axis for our axis revolution. Okay, And then, again, we're going to rotate this two-dimensional region about the x-axis here and create okay, a three-dimensional shape. And now here's where it gets crazy. Gonna, the artists in here are going to have fun and then everyone else is going to get really frustrated. Okay, so we're going to rotate that shape and of course then we'll put some like, uh, let's see, I decided, I decided to do it this way, okay. Like that, like that, like that, like that. Okay. And we create a cylinder. Well, I mean, you can add shading and stuff like that to make it more realistic if you need to, you know, but. All right. So that rectangular region, okay, that rectangular region um, creates this cylinder, all right? This is what kind of dimension of the cylinder? What would you describe that? That is the what of the cylinder? The height, which is a little bit weird, okay, because it's like the height is, we're measuring it like left to right, right? Typically, when we measure a height of something, it's from a bottom of something to a top of something, right? But in this case, right, this is the height because the height has to be perpendicular to the base, and the base of a cylinder is a circle, okay? What is this measurement right here? The radius of the cylinder, okay? We know then, right, the, well, actually, you don't need to know this because you don't need to memorize volume formulas, but maybe you remember pi r squared h, okay? That is the volume for a cylinder. You take a circle, and then you multiply by the height, and that gives you the... You take the area of the base, multiply by the height, and that creates the shape, the volume of the solid. Okay? In this case, our H is going to be some change in X. Okay? Oh, she is not here. Okay. So. Um, the height is going to be some change in X. Okay? R will be determined. The radius is going to be determined by the Y value okay, of f, or you could just think, or just, you know, f of x, okay? So the radius is going to be determined by the, the curve, the function, okay, right? How far away the um, edge is from the axis revolution, okay? Okay, and then that creates then volume is pi times our radius then, which is going to be f of x squared, times the height, delta x. Okay, <coughs> like so. But of course, that's just one cylinder. Yeah? Those are only four bit rotates around the x-axis. Correct, correct. 
And but we'll, uh, it's like the x-axis or really any horizontal axis. And again, we'll get into that here in a little bit. We're not going to do worry about like diagonal um, axis of rotation or anything like that. It'll either be vertical axis of rotation or horizontal axis of rotation. Okay, no diagonals. So, um, okay. Anywho. So that's of course one cylinder, but what if we, and that's for a nice like flat, you know, curve right here, right? A nice flat curve where the function is just like y equals whatever h is there, okay? But what if we have like, you know, something more complex? And this is where I'm gonna make it even more difficult here. <coughs> All right. Then we can add in, of course, you know, we can try and like figure this out using some more rectangles and stuff like that, right? We'll have to kind of use multiple rectangles to find the volume of this shape. So, right, yeah, it does kind of look like a butternut squash on its side. <clears throat> okay, and now I will endeavor to try and draw, whoop, try and draw this with some semblance of accuracy, but it's not going to turn out great. So, okay, so there's that. And we'll do something like that. Like that. Nope, you don't have to. tricky. Something like that. Yeah, it does. It does look like a bunch of plates on a bar. Yes, I would exactly say that. Yes. Okay, if you, for those of you guys, you never thought you'd talk about weightlifting in math class, but there it is. Yeah, it looks like a bunch of plates on a bar. Exactly right. Okay, stacked up like that. Okay, to kind of, that's again an estimate there. So, of course, the volume for this, you know, object would be then cylinder one plus cylinder two plus cylinder three plus cylinder four there. That's what those C1, C2, C3, C4s are for. Okay. <coughs> or, you know, in more fancy terms, we could say it's the sum, right, sigmas for sum, from four, or from one, sorry, to four, pi of f of x squared times delta x. Because again, it's pi r squared, our radius is determined by the function here, okay, and then delta x, the width of each one of those little rectangles that then becomes the rate, or the, sorry, the, the height of the cylinder when you rotate it. <coughs> Okay. But of course, that's only four cylinders, and that's just an approximation. To get a better approximation, the more um, rectangles that we create, then the more cylinders we create, which then creates a better representation of the shape. And so we want the limit to be, as n approaches infinity, we want an infinite number of those cylinders. Okay. That is for infinitely many cylinders here. <clears throat> okay. And we recognize this as the definition of the integral. Right? And so as it turns out then the volume, okay, as delta x approaches zero, we know that delta x then becomes just that dx. Okay, as that as the heights, you know, shrink down so we can fit more and more of those um, cylinders in that same, you know, kind of interval there. All right, that delta x becomes a dx, and so we integrate from a to b, pi times f of x squared dx. And that is our integral there. <coughs> okay, f of x is the radius of the cylinder.
and dx is the cylinder's height. Okay, so really this is what you should be most familiar with right there. That's the formula. Okay, that is the volume of a solid of revolution. Okay, question, Sean. The delta x, as delta x approaches zero, because again, what's happening there, shrinking down, becomes just the dx there. Okay. <clears throat> so we've got um, for the disk method, we have um, two kind of formulations of the disk method depending on whether we have a horizontal or a vertical axis of revolution. Okay, so I'm not going to like do another rotation here. Okay, so for a horizontal axis of revolution, I will indicate that by that little spinny thing there on the axis. All right, that's going to be like what we have up here. The volume equals, I'm going to pull the pi because it's just a coefficient in front. Bless you. Um, integral from A to B of R of X squared DX. <coughs> just for the, like, the idea of being R being the radius, the radius kind of description there. Okay, the radius of, bless you, from the center of, um, of rotation to the curve. Okay. Vertical axis of rotation then. Rotating then like something about something like you know the y axis or x equals two or whatever kind of thing. It's be a very similar formula, except instead of integrating with respect to x, we're now going to integrate with respect to what? Y. You got it. And it'll be an r of y. So we want our our description of our radius to be in terms of y, because we're going to integrate with respect to y. <clears throat> Okay. So horizontal axis of revolution, integrate with respect to x. Vertical axis of revolution, integrate with respect to y. And that's all there is to it. Okay. So by, you know, by far the trickiest part I think of this is the um, visualization, okay, of the region, right? Because you got to make sure you have the right region, and then also. Um, that, once you have that, though, you're kind of coming up with the formula and stuff. It's not that bad. Okay, so let's take a look here at example one. Example one, find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by the graph of f of x equals the square root of sine of x and the x-axis for 0 less than you go to x less than you go to pi, okay, about the x-axis. So in other words, let's draw our region. So sine starts at 0, at pi over 2 it goes to 1, and then at pi it's back down to 0. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to rotate it about the x-axis. So I'm going to draw my little rotation symbol there. Okay. Square root, of, square root of sine of x is our answer. But it's still the volume, the, sorry, the, the, the values are still the same, right? Sine of 0, square root of 0 will be still 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, square root of 1 will still be 1. Sine of pi would still be that. So it's roughly that shape. Roughly that shape there. So, oh, pass 1. Pass it. Okay. So <clears throat> the radius, let's kind of take some time to identify that. <clears throat> okay, remember, the radius is always a measure from the center of our object to the edge. Okay, So the center of this solid of revolution, when we revolve it, the center is going to be this axis. right? And then the edge is going to be determined by what? The function, f. Okay, So it's just f of x. So it's going to be f of x. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and write this in here. Square root of sine of x minus zero, okay, curve minus axis here. 
<clears throat> because sometimes our axis of revolution won't be the x-axis. And so we'll have to kind of adjust our radius calculation based on that. Here, when the, when the radius, sorry, when the axis of revolution is the x-axis, the curve is the precise distance from the x-axis to <coughs> um, the, the end of our region there. Okay? So this is our r of x right there. And so we'll take that here and we'll go ahead and write the volume. So it's volume equals pi times the integral, and I'll go ahead and just use the, okay, the generic formula, and so we'll plug in here. So the integral, it'll be pi times integral from what to what? Zero to pi, okay, again, x limits of integration because we are integrating respect to x. Why are we integrating respect to x? Because we're revolving about the x-axis, so that means in terms of x. Okay, and so then we'll write in our radius here, the square root of the sine of x. If you want to put the minus zero in, you can, but I'm not going to because it's just square root of sine of x. <clears throat> okay, so there's our setup for our volume. And we'll simplify here. Squaring the square root leaves us with just sine of x. <clears throat> Wasn't that nice? All right. Integral of sine? Negative cosine. He was testing us. Did we pass, Lander? All right, so then we'll do negative cosine pi minus negative cosine zero. So many parentheses here. Okay, maybe one a little overboard. <clears throat> cosine of pi is negative one, but it's negative negative one, so it becomes <coughs> positive one. And then cosine of zero is one, but it's negative one, but then it's minus negative one, so it becomes plus one. And so we get two pi. The volume of that crazy shaped object when you rotate it there, all right, would be 2 pi units cubed. Okay? Questions on any of that? All right. One thing I want to point out here, right, before we move on, is that this pi, especially when it comes to like calculator problems, when students, when you guys do this in your calculator, because like typically when you guys do this in your calculator, you're gonna focus on the integral and making sure you type all that stuff in correctly. And then it's very common to miss that pi in front. Just like when we do like the average value formula, that one over B minus A, right? There's, a, there's more likely, you know, in your calculus experience, you're gonna forget that coefficient. Same thing here with these solids of revolution. For whatever reason, we just tend to forget that that pi is in front there. So please don't forget the pi, right? Don't forget that there's a pi in front there. Whenever you do this in your calculator, or if you use your calculator to do this, right, make sure you then multiply your answer by pi. Or when you're typing in your calculator, put pi in front to start it out, then times the integral, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay? But watch that pi. Make sure that you put that pi in front there. Okay? Watch that out. A to B is supposed to be from A to B. Okay? <clears throat> so for the next problem, all right, we're going to find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region that um, about the line Y equals one. Okay, yeah. Morgan, you also right now. Okay. So this one's a bit different because now our axis of rotation is the line y equals 1. Ah, Mr. Widmeyer, you told us, right, when we have an axis of rotation, this one should be this one should be with respect to y because the axis of rotation is y equals 1. No. no. A line y equals 1 is vertical or horizontal? horizontal? Horizontal. And so this needs to be with respect to what? X. X. Okay, X. So please watch that. Okay, yes, it says y equals 1 there. But that is a horizontal line, okay? So horizontal axis of revolution. 
So, in terms of x, exclamation point, okay? Because that's important for you, right? All right, so let's again sketch this little region out here. So we'll focus on the, the 2 minus x squared here maybe first, okay? And so at 0, we're going to have the 2, and then at 1, it'll be negative 1 and 1. It's going to be y value of 1 on both sides here. So it's going to be like this frowny, frowny face parabola, okay? A sad parabola. We also have the line... G of x equals 1 is another boundary for our region. So G of x equals 1, that is a horizontal line. So it's going to look like this. Okay. And those are our only two boundaries. So you need to uh, kind of like identify here what is the region that's bounded by just those two curves. And it's this little piece right here, right? It's this little region right here. So this is our region. This is an important aspect because this region helps you to identify what your limits of integration are. If you get that region wrong, you're going to mess up your problem. Okay. What are we rotating about? The line y equals 1. So it's up here is our axis of rotation. Okay. So our radius in this problem now, our radius is not 2 minus x squared alone. It is not just this top curve, okay? Because this top curve, this, this, this y value that this top curve describes, right? It's y equals 2 minus x squared. This y value describes the distance from the x-axis to the curve. But we're not interested in the distance from the x-axis to the curve. We need the distance from this axis of revolution to the curve, right? The radius is from the center of your object to the edge. The center of the object is going to be right there at the axis of revolution. So our radius is the distance from here to here. So the radius is going to be curve minus axis of rotation. Okay. So we need to do our curve, which is 2 minus x squared, minus what's our axis of rotation again? 1. So 2 minus x squared minus 1. That will give us this correct height. <clears throat> or I should really say radius, okay, because it is really a radius. Okay, that'll give us the correct radius from the center to the curve here, center to curve, center to curve. That distance is 2 minus x squared minus 1, which if we simplify is just 1 minus x squared then. So setting up our volume then, volume equals pi times the integral, okay. Right, we're going to integrate from negative 1 to 1. Now, we're kind of like using our visual, you know, uh, aspect here to kind of confirm that. But let's confirm that algebraically too. I'll go over here real quick and we'll say, okay, let's identify the bounds just to make sure that's right. In order to identify the bounds in this case, what should we do? Set the two curves uh, that bound our region equal to one another. So 2 minus x squared equals 1. <clears throat> so I'll subtract the 1 over. I'll add the x squared over so I get x squared equals 1. Square root both sides. x equals Plus or minus one. Very good. <clears throat> so, aha, you know, we were right in our visual inspection there. Okay? That's good. <clears throat> so, we do want to integrate from negative one to one. Pi's in front there, and it's our radius. Again, our radius is one minus x squared here. Squared dx. <clears throat> okay? So, there's our formula. Okay. You will not be given the disk method formula, okay, on any test or quiz, you will need to have that down, okay, you need to remember that, just like you have to memorize, you know, the uh, average value formula, 1 over b minus a, integral a to b of your function, same idea here, you'll need to remember this formula, okay, and how it works. <laughs> You're very busy today. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, CC is not here today. She's not, okay. <clears throat> okay, so, um, let's do this one here too. Again, we could use our calculators, but nah. All right, so 1, let's see here. 
Um, it'll be minus an x squared minus 2x squared, and then plus x to the fourth. <coughs> okay, and now I can integrate this. Pi times x minus 2 thirds x cubed plus 1 fifth x to the fifth, evaluated from negative 1 to 1. which leaves pi times, and let's see, I'll do this, 1 minus 2 thirds plus 1 fifth minus negative 1 plus 2 thirds minus 1 fifth. <coughs> okay. And again, if this were a free response question, you'd stop right there. All right, but of course you should be able to um, simplify this. So let's be what minus four thirds, but then minus four thirds, but then times five, so minus twenty fifteenths, <coughs> and then let's see here plus one fifth, so two fifths, two three, so plus six fifteenths. I guess I should really make this thirty fifteenths. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's see here. So 30 minus 20 is 10, plus 6 is 16, so 16 pi over 15. You should be able to still simplify those fractions, though, combine them together if this is a non-calculator question. Could it be non-calculator? Absolutely. Right? Could it be multiple choice. You need to be able to match your answer to what's there. Okay. So 16 pi over 15. All right. Moving on. Number three here. All right. <clears throat> Find the volume of solid formed by revolving region bounded from above by y equals cube root of x plus 1 from the right by x equals 7 and below by y equals 0 about the line x equals 7. Aha! So our axis of revolution is x equals something, so that means we need to integrate with respect to x, right? No. No, okay. We, our axis of revolution is what? Vertical or horizontal? Vertical axis of revolution. <laughs> That's different, right? We've only done horizontal so far. When we have to do a vertical axis of revolution, that means we need to integrate with respect to y. Okay, y. Vertical axis of revolution. So integrate with respect to y and in terms of y, okay? Which means that our curve here, is that in terms of y? No. Nope, so we have to rewrite it in terms of y here. So let's see here, we've got y equals the cube root of x plus one. So we'll cube both sides, you get y cubed equals x plus one, and so x equals y cubed minus one. I'm still going to try and like graph this a little bit here for us too. Just tonight. again, I think it's helpful to draw a picture. You might think it's more frustrating to draw a picture. I get that. <clears throat> All right, so let's see here. If I plug in negative 1 for x, negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So cubed is 0, 0. So it's going to be 0 right there. Okay, and let's see here. If I plug in 0, 0 plus 1 is 1. Cube root of 1 is 1. So I have a point right there at 0. And then in order to get a y value of 2, I'm going to need x to be 7. So let's see here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. Like that. Of course, it continues on from there. And continues on from here, too. <clears throat> So there's our curve, but that's not quite a region yet, right? It's not quite a region yet. We have to include our other boundaries. So um, from above, by that curve, from the right, by x equals 7, so the line x equals 7, that is a vertical line here. That's a boundary line right there. Okay, And below, by the line y equals 0, that's the x-axis. So our region then is this, right? That is the region that bounds, that's bounded by all of those pieces. 
the line x equals 7, the curve, and the line y equals 0. Okay? And we are rotating about the line x equals 7. <coughs> so, question. Um, correct. Well, so like, because like, um, let me see here. Yes, it, it will, it will all, it will get taken care of, I guess I'll say. Yeah, you don't need to worry about that in this case. I see what you're saying. Because like the part of the region is to the left of the x-axis, part of the region to the, is to the right kind of thing. Yeah. No, that'll get taken care of um, in the integral. You don't have to like, yeah, worry about breaking it up or anything like that. Okay. Um, so... Remember, our <laughs> radius, right, we're going to do curve minus axis here, okay? So our curve, well, y equals cube root of x plus 1, but because we need to be with respect to y, we're going to use x equals y cubed minus 1. So y cubed minus 1 minus <clears throat> 7, <clears throat> our axis there, okay? And so then we have the volume is pi times the integral. We don't have our limits of integration, do we? Well, you can at least know what's the lower limit of integration going to be. Zero, again, we're going to respect to y, so it's going to be zero. And what does it look like the upper limit's going to be? It looks like it'll be two, right? But again, we can confirm that if we go to do our little bounds calculation over here. We can, I'm going to use the x equals y cubed minus 1, and then x equals um, 7 is the other boundary there. So 7 equals y cubed minus 1, 8 equals y cubed, cube root both sides, y equals 2. And so there's our upper limit right there. Okay, but again, it's kind of like a side calculation there. All right, so from 0 to 2 of this right here. And I guess that simplifies. I should simplify that. y cubed minus 8. Okay. So y cubed minus 8 quantity squared, <clears throat> excuse me, dy. And for this one, let's go ahead and just use our calculators for this one, okay? So why don't you guys, let's type this into our calculators and see if we can all get a value. <clears throat> the same value, hopefully. So hopefully you get one of these two answers here. Right. If you want to get a precise answer without having to round, okay, and sometimes you'll still have to round just because, you know, whatever reason. Bless you. If you leave the pi out, Mr. Wittmeyer, you just said don't forget to include the pi. I know, I did. But if you want to leave the pi out, you can just do the integral from 0 to 2 of this squared in your calculator. You'll get 576 sevenths when you do math enter enter to your answer. And then you can just throw the pi right in there next to it for the precise answer. Alternatively, right, 258.508 is what you get when you put the pi in front. So, questions on any of that? All right, there's one more problem that uh, I want us to be able to do, or that I, I want us to do here, but I think I'm gonna have you guys try this one. So example four, okay, you give this one a try. <clears throat> okay. Let's see what you can come up with there. Um, e yeah, go ahead. You can use your calculators for this one, yeah. But of course, set up, you need to still set up the integral and stuff like that. <clears throat>
Yeah, that'll be that'll be the the end. Were <coughs> <coughs> you guys in Hagerstown? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm so glad that they opened one up in Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they put French fries on their sandwiches there. From Manny Brothers. Yeah. It's interesting. God, it's interesting. It's so good. And then they have BLT Tater Tots. I want to go to the restaurant for this. Three slash resort. This is what it is. I want to work there. I didn't mean to ever win a nod. Give me like one more minute here, one more minute. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look here, see what you guys are able to come up with. Hopefully it was something like that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, bless you, bless you. <clears throat> okay, questions on any of that? Um, that's all you got for today. Tomorrow we'll get into uh, an extension of the disk method called the washer method. Okay. So you'll just have to wait and see what that's all about, or you can read about it and figure it out on your own. Or... Anyway. <clears throat> Homework is going to be posted here to Google Classroom in just a sec, so if you want to get started on that, it would be a good idea. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Yes. Yeah.